Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 97th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I got an excellent interview this week with another mathematical heretic. But unlike yours truly, this mathematical heretic is in fact a distinguished professor of mathematics at Rutgers University. I spoke with Dr. Doran Zeilberger, who is both a very accomplished professional mathematician as well as a strong dissident who disagrees with many of the foundational axioms of modern mathematics. I recently discovered his work in my own research, and as you can imagine, I was extremely excited to be able to interview him. In my opinion, there just aren't that many mathematical minds who are, first of all, interested in foundational questions and more philosophical questions in mathematics, much less interested and radically independent thinkers. Dr. Zeilberger is both interested and a radically independent thinker. In his professional career, he's also won a bunch of awards. He's won the Lester Ford Award for his work in mathematics. He's the recipient of the Leroy Steele Prize for his co-development of WZ theory. In 2004, he was awarded the Euler Medal. In 2016, he received the David Robbins Prize of the American Mathematical Society. So this is a man with impeccable credentials and yet disagrees with 99% of his colleagues about the fundamental ideas in their discipline. We cover a huge range of topics in this interview. We talk a lot about infinity, and since Dr. Zeilberger is an ultra-finitist, he rejects the idea of the completed infinity. We also talk about the notion of mathematical proof and how it might be a bit overrated, especially in the modern mathematical world. He's got a ton of great articles I also recommend people check out if they're interested, like one entitled Real Analysis is a Degenerate Case of Discrete Analysis, which is a hysterical title. He's got articles talking about mathematics as a religion. He's got a ton of lectures out there on YouTube talking about his unorthodox views of mathematics and new ways to think about mathematics. What I found also interesting that we covered is the future, the predicted future of the math profession, where Dr. Zeilberger thinks there's just going to be a paradigm shift in the math profession, that people might look back on 20th century mathematics and kind of laugh at lots of the superstitious thinking that found its way nestled into the foundations of mathematics. So if you've been following my work with, with uh, my written work or Patterson in Pursuit for a while, you know, this is, this is like uh, the holy grail of interviews. I'll give you no more introduction. I hope you guys enjoy my conversation with Dr. Doran Zeilberger, a distinguished professor of mathematics at Rutgers University. All right, Dr. Doran Zeilberger, thanks so much for coming on Patterson in Pursuit. I'm really excited to get to talk to you today. Yeah, I'm very excited too. Uh, so I've got a ton of questions for you because just in the last several years, I've been researching mathematics more from a philosophical perspective. And my opinion about math has radically changed in a way that I didn't even know was possible. I had the assumption that a lot of people have that math as a discipline is kind of the most rigorous of all areas of thought, that there's not really room for disagreement in mathematics, that kind of the yeah. story of mathematics is one proof that's absolutely logically certain that's built on top of, uh, of, of another, and that Math, mathematicians can't really disagree with one another because everything is so crystal clear, logical, and laid out and, perci uh, and precise. Yeah, exactly. This, this yeah. is the dogma of the prevailing religion that unfortunately is still the dominant religion. But hopefully this will change eventually. So, so you, it's, it's, it, I would say that you are an unorthodox mathematician. And even putting those two words together, I think would be surprising to people. Like there is such a thing as an unorthodox mathematician. What does that mean? Yeah, so, I, yeah. Yeah, so so what is your perspective on this, uh, on mathematics as a general discipline? Do you think the story that we're told is just completely wrong? Is there a lot of proofs that maybe aren't so certain? What are your thoughts? Oh, uh, that's a good point. Uh, the, this is, uh, of course, even the most pure mathematicians con uh, concede that nothing is centered 100% uh, certain because there's always a possibility that there was an error. So even the most orthodox mathematician uh, would conceive that this is an approximately uh, approximate uh, ideal 
that mathematics is completely certain. It tries to be certain, and but uh, I'm sure that even if you uh, look at the most re uh, religious fanatical mathematician, uh, if he or she would be pressed, they would admit that there's a tiny probability that, for example, the Pythagorean theorems proof is flawed because there were quite a few examples of proofs that were believed to be correct, and later there were found errors. But was a but it's an idealization, like a, a perfect vacuum. So, a, but of course, ideally, people think that indeed mathematics is absolutely truth and certain. But this is, of course, a false. Now, it's true that many, for most of the a, established theorems, for example, definitely the Pythagorean theorem, it's absolutely certain. But my take is the reason it's absolutely certain, or almost not absolutely, that's too strong, but with very high probability, it's a, a correct proof and correct statement, because all these human-generated theorems were really kind of shallow. If a human can do it, it cannot be very deep. <laughs> I like that uh, perspective. So, so what about uh, on this idea of absolute certainty? Um, what about even the more elementary claims? Let's say of arithmetic. So, if we're not yeah. talking about necessarily the, the higher order proofs or anything, what, do you think arithmetic can be something we, are, we can be certain about? Absolutely certain about. Well, absolutely. With this disclaimer, yeah, as absolute certainty as you can be, as long as you stick to finite statements. Mm. Everything that has infinite in it is already a priori completely meaningless. It's not even wrong. It's just <laughs> utterly meaningless. Okay, can you go into that a little bit? Because I, 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 yes. uh, I, I want to ask you some questions from the perspective of somebody that wouldn't agree with you. I already agree with you. Um, and this is why I'm so excited to talk with you, because so few people yes. say that. Um, yes. But it, it, from the outside, it seems like the notion of infinities is absolutely rooted in a bunch of central conceptions of modern mathematics. So when you say the notion of infinity might be, you know, dubious or ridiculous or not even yeah. wrong, it sounds like you're saying something that's like very, very radical. So can you explain your conception of infinity and, and, and where you think we went wrong and maybe what, what ideas have to be revised based on these ideas? No, it's, it's a, my, I, I'm not a professional philosopher and in in a way, it's embarrassingly simple. So, you know, for a long time, uh, God was the big dogma. And then um, they had other uh, movements and reform, reformists, but they never doubted the existence of God. Uh, Martin Luther, Luther never uh, ever doubted that God exists mm -hmm. or that Jesus exists. That, that had some... Uh, minor, or maybe not so minor to him, uh, tweaks on the old dogma. So similarly, with infinity, it's such a rooted thing. But from a point of view of an atheist, all these squabbles about uh, religion are completely, uh, at, at best, culturally interesting. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you cannot, I cannot relate to it. So, so in a way, I'm not as passionate, because for me, it's so obvious that the whole notion of infinity is completely bogus, so I don't even see the point of talking about it. And no offense to, uh, for example, it was a very interesting interview I did with a philosopher, uh, Michael Hummer, and he, ho he wrote a whole book mm -hmm. about it. So I'm not going to write a whole book about something that to me is so obvious. For example, if an atheist writes a book, God does not exist, he doesn't need 300 pages to prove it. <laughs> it's just obvious that there's no God. Period. So in the book would be only one, one, one sentence. There does not, God does not exist. So my book would be <laughs> infinite that exists. Period. Okay. So, so that sounds, I mean, that sounds very provocative and I agree with the conclusion, but doesn't that imply that you've like, you've just broken mathematics. Like if we, if we say infinity doesn't exist, well, how, can you rescue things like calculus? I mean, what are your thoughts? About, by all means, by all means. Yeah. There is a very, you know, in the, uh, once upon a time, there was 
an emperor called, Ale called Alexander. And there was also a very, a very, very challenging knot, uh, the Gordian knot that nobody could untangle. And people tried very, very hard. Then uh, came Alexander the Great and with one swoop of his sword uh, uh, unraveled it. So this, so my solution uh, is also similar. There is a canonical way of rescuing 90% uh, of current mathematics uh, without ever mentioning infinity, yeah. without all this uh, mental gymnastics of the intu intuitionist and constructivist that still are like Lutherans, they still believe in mm -hmm. the uh, potential infinity and they go to lots of uh, uh, mental, intellectual acrobatics to resolve, quote unquote, all the paradoxes, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's extremely simple. Uh, so whether, uh, once again, also I want to take issue with Michael Homer. Uh, in, in, he mentions that there's no largest <laughs> and largest uh, integer. You can always add one. That's another stupid thing. How does he know? <laughs> there's no there's no proof. It's just a stupid axiom that you can take uh, take it or leave it. And I so this is still I'm not, in this respect I'm an agnostic. Uh, I famously once said that there is a, a largest n number which nobody knows, but if you add one to it, you go back to zero. So it's like a cycle when you go around the planet. You go back. If you go the same direction all the time, you, you head west. Eventually, uh, you wind up where you are. So this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but this is still an open question. Uh, but you can redo mathematics uh, without using the so-called piano axiom. You can redo everything. Also calculus, you can uh, redo everything by completely fanatistic means. Okay, what and about... And for me, it's so obvious, I don't even bother to write it down. So, <laughs> so, uh, what, so, so when I talk to some people about this, because I, I come at this from a philosophical perspective, not really a yeah. mathematical one, a lot of times people will bring up real analysis, like the, the whole subject of real analysis, an analysis of real numbers, which seem yeah. to have this connection with infinity. So, so what are your thoughts on real analysis? Yeah, How do so you there's not a that? lab of theology. If we have this theology and... And then you had famously uh, Newton and Leibniz who developed calculus in a quote-unquote unrigorous way. Then people had all these uh, paradoxes. And then came the 19th century mathematicians Cauchy and Weierstrass and allegedly made it all rigorous with the epsilon and delta mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, and it was, in a way, it's also fanatistic. It's, it's an algorithm. So... <laughs> In, in a way, they didn't know it, but they didn't really have to use infinity. They, in a way, they rescued it by making it in, an algorithm. So to prove that something, a function is continuous, for example, x squared is continuous, it's really an algorithm. For every epsilon, blah, 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 you have a delta, and you have an explicit algorithm that a computer can be implemented on the computer. So in a way, they made the way step in the right direction. But there is even a simpler way. Make everything discrete analysis. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, no, no more uh, limits. So uh, you have, like in physics, you have the Planck distance. This is believed to be the shortest uh, distance possible in the physical universe. So you have something analogous in calculus uh, that we have, we have no idea what it is. And once again, it's an agnostic whether it actually exists or not, that's a moot question. Uh, that's an irrelevant question. You can redo the whole calculus. I can rewrite the calculus uh, the textbook in a much shorter way by replacing derivatives by finite differences. Okay, so I, I have a, a, three things to say. First of all, I would love, I know you, you had a quip there where you said it's so obvious I don't even want to write it down. Uh, I, I, for the sake of future mathematicians, please do write it down, uh, because I, I feel like that would be very, uh, very important. Well, I, I kind of, yeah, I have a nine-page paper uh, uh, that you could look at my website. Uh, real analysis is a degenerate case of discrete analysis. Yes, like I saw that. I actually downloaded that, and uh, I just loved the title. Okay. I thought that was hysterical. Yeah, so the um, outline of the thing, is, 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 is everything is outlined there, and the rest is just details. Okay. An another thing I want to say, I want to um, 
got to run this idea by you. So when there's a question of, you know, what, what might the big, the largest integer be, or what might this, uh, I like to call the idea of a, of a fundamental, like a mathematical atom. I like to call it a base unit. Yeah. It's like, what could the base unit be of mathematics? if Everything is discrete. Um, and yeah. I, I think this is kind of a philosophical question, but perhaps this is a resolution. Um, the reason that they're, that it, it's kind of confusing or, or misleading to talk about the largest integer. Oh, you could just add one to it. Therefore, there must be an actualized infinity. What if numbers themselves are just constructions of our own mind? And if that's the case, then at any given time, there is a largest number that has been conceived or constructed. And yeah, you can add one to it. But in the process of adding one to it, you've created then a new largest number. Could that work? Uh, no, I don't agree with this. Hmm. Uh, well, what? Uh, so that's another aspect of my uh, redoing mathematics, uh, because I, I'm very big on symbolic computations. Mm. Uh, for example, I use Maple, but Mathematica and uh, the free software Sage is symbolic. So if you, so you know, it's a little bit like nom nominalism. Mm. So uh, if n is a symbol, n plus one is a symbol. Mm. So that's one way to rescue mathematics uh, by uh, redoing the piano axiom, uh, if something is true for n, it's also true for n plus one. Mm. But n is not a concrete number. If you plug in one of the finite numbers, the only exist finitely many numbers, then you get a correct statement. Mm. Mm. But you can also keep n as a symbol, and then uh, it's just true symbolically. So to give me a simple example, uh, if a and b are two integers or numbers, doesn't matter. Uh, a plus B equals B plus A. This is a fact. Mm. Now, the conventional wisdom is it, it's true for every uh, number A and B. Suppose uh, on integer for any two integers, A and B, A plus B equals B plus A. But for me, this is already meaningless because when you say, uh, and, and not even wrong, if A plus B equals B plus A, but for every two integers A and B, you implicitly assume that you have an infinite supply of them. Mm. So the correct statement is A plus B equals B plus A for any finite integers. That's the only integers that exist. And also A plus B equals B plus A for symbolic integers. Mm -hmm. So once you have the phrase symbolic uh, in front, then everything can be rescued. Okay. So do you think, in your kind of conceiving of what numbers are, do you think then they are kind of platonic objects in the sense that numbers exist separate of human minds and maybe separate of physical space. They're kind of yes, in another... Yes, that's my concession to Platonism. Uh, finite <laughs> numbers do exist. But once again, it's a philosophical issue, hmm. and uh, who knows <laughs> But okay. if they had to be. Uh, so so how, what, what kind of a role do you think um, computation, like actual math on computers should play in the development of mathematics. Because when I, again, from the outside, when I think of like the pro progression of a discipline um, and I yeah. look at the invention of computers, I think to myself, okay, that's kind of the holy grail of mathematics. Um, and, it, yeah. and it probably should, should maybe, uh, like the theories and the theorems and the philosophy might need to change around what we can do with with computers now so what do yeah. you think what do you think about that how important are computers to develop to the development of mathematical knowledge and like mathematics knowledge in the abstract like our, our understanding of mathematics is kind of a discipline no computers are already revolutionizing the practice of mathematics and because of computers the current religion will completely change and in a hundred years possibly 50 years people think make fun of the superstition of 20th century mathematicians with a pathetic <laughs> belief that uh, absolute certainty because uh, computers uh, like uh, already AlphaGo uh, is much better than mm -hmm. any Go player and uh, the chess playing uh, uh, Deep, Deep Blue uh, can beat any. So analogously, mathematics uh, will already and all the theorems that mathematicians, even, for example, the thomas theorem under Wiles, uh, in 50 years, there'll be a computer, a computer can find a much better proof all by itself mm. without any human uh, help. 
just by doing machine learning. I mean, this is an A still in the future, but eventually everything, all the corpus of mathematics so far will be just be done in a very fast from scratch, I've been issue by computers. Yeah, it's funny. You mentioned earlier that um, the move towards epsilon delta kind of might maybe rescued some ideas in calculus and made them a little more rigorous. Uh, I kind of feel the same way about um, computation in practice. So it's like, if it's the case that calculus can work on computers, it is thus the case that we must have a discrete calculus. Because computers operate. Yeah, good are, point. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th it, so that's the kind of th that's. It's funny when I've argued with people about this, they talk about, oh, you can't do calculus without infinities, and I'm saying, no, 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 we are doing calculus without infinities. Like all yeah, of that is calculus. Exactly. Good point. <laughs> it is actually irony uh, when you actually do numerical computations when you have a partial differential equation. The first thing you do is discretize it, and you actually solve a difference equation, a, right. a finite difference equation. Okay, so let's get into some more uh, ideas then. So we talked about real numbers a little bit. What about transcendental numbers? What about something like pi? This is the you know three point one four one five nine dot 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 and so on, whatever the and so on means. How? W w what is your thoughts on pi? If yeah, you, here I yeah. also like to take issue uh, with your excellent article. Uh, pi is finite. <laughs> uh, There's a famous thing of, of uh, Derrida uh, uh, saying about what is is. Uh, what is the what is the construction? So he refused to answer the question because it tacitly assumed that there is something like is. So okay. instead of pi is a number, uh, it's like like saying uh, I don't know a, a unicorn is an animal. Uh, so pi is not even a number. Pi really doesn't exist the way. So Lindemann was wrong when he proved he claimed to have we claim that pi is a transcendental number. Mm. This is nonsense. Of course, what he did was very valuable, but he did prove that pi is not a number. So, so um, in your language then, when you're talking about pi, like yeah. not, not saying that it's a number, what is the thing that we're referencing? What is the 3.14159? What, what's going on there if it's not a number? Yeah, so the way to uh, rescue it is still a useful thing, but, and, but it's not 3.1.159 dot, 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 dot. This implicitly assumes that you have, you can go forever. Mm. And this is complete nonsense. You cannot go forever, but it's also not finite. Uh, it's not even a number. Uh, so the way to get around it is, uh, I, I gave a talk about it uh, in Pi Day, this last Pi Day. So uh, the, the Pi is an equivalence class of algorithms. So you have many algorithms to compute approximations to pi. So was, uh, mm. it's also called, uh, when you try to do, for example, Thomas Hales in his proof of the Kepler conjecture, the second phase when he made it, want to make it completely rigorous. Before he used floating points and floating points uses round of errors and people uh, criticized it for being non-rigorous and they had, they had a point, although it was a very pedantic point. And then poor Tom has spent 10 years in setting them up by making everything completely rigorous by using interval arithmetic. So the statement that a, a pi lies between 3 and 1 tenth and 3 and uh, 1 fifth makes sense. It lies in the in interval. Since so rational numbers do exist, so and then you can say pi is uh, larger than 31 over 100 and less than 32 over 100 and so on. So for, for any epsilon, it's like the epsilon things, uh, you can find out, you can come up with an interval uh, AB where A and B are rational and hence meaningful mm. entities such that pi, quote unquote, uh, is between A and B. So this is a meaningful thing. So is that also the same with irrational numbers in general? Yes, yes. For example, square root of 2 uh, makes sense as a symbol. You can define square root of 2 uh, by its property, by its defining property. It's a symbol, not a number, a symbol mm. that has the property that x squared equals 2. Then it's also true Then, whatever it is, it lies in the interval between 1.4 and 1.41. 1 
and so on. This reminds me, um, I was doing a little research on uh, imaginary numbers. And if yeah. I'm not mistaken, the creator of uh, imaginary numbers called the square root of negative one a useful fiction. And, and <laughs> he said something along the lines of, you know, this doesn't really make any sense. But if we if we get away with it, if we treat it as just an empty symbol, then actually we can solve these math equations. And yeah, yeah, that's a great analogy. Yeah, right. yeah. I thought to myself, wow, that's actually really that's a smart way of thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. And then the that's that seems to have been lost in the uh, in the theorizing afterwards that the the actual yeah. creator of it thought of as thought of as a useful fiction, and then everybody else or 99% of the mathematicians after the fact seem to think, take it as some transcendental truth or entity. Right, right, right. It's what we get, what we get used to, yeah, the force of habits. Yeah, that's a good point. Very good point. Okay, so I want to ask about another question that this is more of an area of my active research I'm trying to really sort out carefully, is Gödel's incompleteness theorems. So yes. in philosophy... It's also my pet peeve. Thanks for bringing it up. Excellent. Yeah. Um, in philosophy, they come up a lot. <laughs> they come up a lot when people are making very bad arguments, and uh, they say, you know, if you're trying to be logically rigorous or something, you go, "Oh no, like you, you can't be fully rigorous because you know Gödel's incompleteness theorems." So I'm thinking, what? What are you talking about? So this has been a, a multi-year long investigation, really trying to wrap my head around Gödel. The first thing I yeah. would say is, th this is an area where I'm inherently skeptical because what I found in talking with mathematicians and everybody else is almost nobody has actually gone through Gödel's proofs. They're apparently very complicated, and they say, yes, oh, well, I, I've never gone through them, but there are these really <laughs> smart mathematicians out there who have gone through and they've checked all of it, and it all checks out. And I'm thinking, well, how do you know? That, that seems like a lot of trust. So this is the first thing. I, I, so that's my impression from the outside. Is that also what's going on in the inside of, of math? Do you, think that, uh, do you think that not a lot of people are actually che double-checking Gödel at this point? No, no, I'm sure that professional logicians uh, went through it, and there's nothing wrong with Gödel's meta-proof. Uh, and uh, the idea behind met, uh, the proofs uh, are very simple. And in fact, uh, Alan Turing uh, famously uh, had uh, something analogous that uh, the halting, pro the halting program, uh, problem is undecidable. Uh, this is, uh, you can uh, have in half a page. In fact, I have a little a half-page note that uh, proves uh, Turing's statement. Mm. So, and so philosophically, instead of using Gödel, so Gödel, the details of Gödel's of, uh, proof are very daunting, but the main idea is basically a takeoff of the Laios paradox, mm -hmm. but he is just misunderstood. So what he did, for, from my point of view, uh, Gödel and much simpler uh, Turing, <laughs> they prove something even more profound, that in infinity is baloney and doesn't exist because it leads to this paradox. So there's a statement that exists, true, but unprovable statement is completely stupid. Okay, so what's the relation then? This is something I'm really trying to unpack here because I think yeah. this would be a very big deal, but it's hard for me to put my finger exactly on it. So yeah. what is the relation between Gödel's incompleteness theorems and infinity? Oh, because what Gödel proved that the Principia Mathematica and the uh, or the Hilbert program, uh, he he used infinite sets. It only applies his uh, paradox, so to speak, only applies to infinite mathematics because uh, his, his trick, the idea behind Gödel, is extremely simple. Only the details are complicated, and, and he was not the best writer, but. Uh, so basically, you look at a typical statement in mainstream mainstream number theory. So l look at it. It has quantifiers uh, for every, and they exist. And also, it has logical connectives. So you look at such a statement, and then he has this beautiful dictionary that converts uh, any uh, mathematical statement into a number theoretical statement from the meta level to the object level. He has this dictionary. And then you also look at the proof. What's the proof? Is that the sequence, a finite combinatorial sequence of statements, uh, and you go from one step to the other using one of the so-called axioms. That, And then by this very clever dictionary, he <laughs> concocted a very, very complicated 
a statement that for an orthodox mathematician like Hilbert made perfect sense. And uh, what it said that uh, if you translate it back to the meta level, I am unprovable. So the conclusion was that <laughs> this is a correct statement, uh, but it's unprovable and approved by contradictions, like the Lyos paradox. But the flaw in this things, he implicitly assumed that statements that have quantified the range of infinite sets uh, are meaningful. Mm -hmm. But if you don't accept it, for me, what he proved is all baloney. So uh, what, I, what people call undecidable, I call uh, not even a meaningless a posteriori, even a posteriori meaning less. So some statements, every statement that has quantifiers, for example, a very simple statement, for every integer a, a plus one equals one plus a, for every integer a, is a priori meaning less, because it implicitly assumes that there is an infinite supply of integers. Mm. Stupid, baloney. <laughs> so, so this is wrong. So okay. the correct statement, uh, A plus 1 equals 1 plus A for symbolic A. And now it's a meaningful statement because A is a finite symbol. Mm. So this is true. So in this case, A plus 1 equals 1 plus A, the statement is a priori, meaning less, but could be easily made a posteriori, meaning full, by con instead of doing the quantifier for every A, for symbolic A. Now, the sentence, the uh, mathematical number theoretical uh, statement that Gödel concocted is uh, up, uh, it's not even meaning, it's also a posteriori meaningless. So, so this is uh, my dictionary, yeah. So, so to, be, to be clear, if it's the case that there are only finite sets, then yeah. what happens? Does, does Gödel's proof not work? No, in a way, it's a proof by contradiction. It's uh, analogous to the square root of two, being irrational. So for my, the way my take on Gödel's thing, he proved that uh, most mathematical statements, orthodox mathematical statements, they have quantifiers that range over infinite sets are, uh, are not... Uh, are, Meaningless, even a posteriori. Because There's no they way need to, a paradox. to rescue them. Yeah. Right. And never no way to rescue them. Unlike one plus a equals a plus one, for which can be resurrected and deeper deeper statements, for example, like Grand's theorem, every positive integer n uh, can be written as a sum of four squares can be resurrected uh, from my point of view. But uh, all the statements the statements that Gödel and many others like it, probably most of them, uh, are complete gibberish. And there's no way to resurrect them. Okay, so th so I'm gonna um, give an, an analogy here and tell me if this is something similar. So yeah, when I'm when I'm having arguments with people who have you know math education and we're talking about infinities, um, yeah, and some of the more remarkable claims of mathematicians that a lot of times they say, okay, well, give me an example of you know where this leads to paradoxical reasoning. And I okay, well, yeah. what's an example? That's interesting that you say. Girdle is an example. I'm going to come back to that. But um, one, a, 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 a proof that I like to bring up is um, the Banach-Tarski paradox. Yeah. Now, because I, because from the outside, you see the claims for people who don't know. Uh, the idea yeah. is like you have a sphere, and then you can, uh, you know, cut apart the sphere into a finite yeah, amount yeah. of yeah. sets, and then reassemble the sets, and then you get a, 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 a you get two spheres. You get a sphere, and yeah. then another sphere, the identical size. So just that's by, another proof of infinity is a baloney. Because right. That, that's exa that, <laughs> exactly. So I see that and say, okay, what you've just like. Uh, there's a lot of people that will say, oh, that just shows the counterintuitiveness of some of these ideas in mathematics. I'm thinking, that's not counterintuitive. I think it, that's a pretty well, that's, clear demonstration of a <laughs> catastrophic flaw. Okay. <laughs> yes. So you think it's the same thing going on with Gödel? It's a kind of demonstration that something's gone awry here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the banach uh, paradox is not a good example of how everything with infinity is bogus. Mm. Okay. So, but still, it could be an interesting mathematical. It, it could be still a game. You can pretend. So uh, 
it, it's still like it, like it says uh, the queen uh, says and the, the the king and queen of chess are not actually king and queens. It's a game. So it's still as a game, as an intellectual game that some people may enjoy. I don't. Uh, it still makes sense, but only as a game. Mm. And this paradox is uh, it's still okay. Makes so, sense as a game, but the ontological. Uh, Validity is 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 not nil. Okay, so so for for the rest of the world, um, especially if they have mathematics training, they're going to say yeah. this is just. There's no way that everybody in the math community could be fundamentally mistaken. Like this, th- th- there's an assumption. I think part of the mathematics religion is that mathematics is kind of the language of God. And w- <laughs> when you discover truth in the language of God, there's no way that it could possibly be wrong. Therefore, to yeah. step back and, and try to, you know, a- analyze whether or not the mathematics is correct and conclude that maybe everybody for the last century or two centuries is completely mistaken is such a radical claim. Uh, it's like no, a, no, 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 let me yeah. uh, co- uh, qualify it. Sure. Uh, most, except for the Cantor set, uh, Cantor and all the... Uh, ultra, uh, ultra esoteric logic, all the mathematics that is used in science, and all the things can be easily resurrected right. and uh, became and be- become legit by doing this translation. So it's not like uh, things will be lost uh, forever. It's just the uh, the way of thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. I like to say that you know the math might be able to be rescued. The actual problem is the stories that mathematicians tell about the math. Yes, yes. Yes, it's yes. Yeah. Okay, but but yeah. um so are there areas though that you think can't be rescued? Do you think that there's there's fundamental assumptions and maybe it's topology or something in real analysis, some actual conclusions or proofs or that just won't that can't be rescued. They're just too far gone. Uh, in principle, if you look at it, for for the uh, set for infinitary set theory, for example, what uh, you uh, Woodin and the professional set theorist or Saron Scheller that I admi- admire very much as uh, mathematical athletes uh, and like chess players. Uh, so it's it's a game. So for anybody who cares about it, uh, there's nothing wrong with this. It is not a philosophical issue whether it has any. Uh, but it represents anything. In fact, ironically, uh, Paul Cohen, the patron saint of set theory, he was in a way a finitist. But since he didn't like to argue, he was a, a very peaceful person. He never uh, overstated it. But if you look at one of his beautiful papers, he says that it's just a empty game. Uh, it's just a game, set theory. So what he allegedly proved that the continuum hypothesis is undecidable. Uh, for him, uh, uh, he didn't believe that infinity. For, so he, deep inside, or even not deep inside, he meant it. So uh, what he meant was just a game. It's a game like chess uh, mm-hmm. of uh, starting with uh, the Ramelo Frankel uh, choice set theory. That he, that he proved that in this game, uh, like in chess, uh, some moves cannot, are not readable. So in this case, the statement, the, con- the continuum hypothesis is true, is not readable, and the statement, in fact, that's probably good already published, the statement that the continuum hypothesis is false is also not readable. So once again, it's yet another proof that it's all ontologically baloney, mm. but still, uh, it's still be a, an intellect, a fun to some people, not to me. So here I disagree with Paul Cohen. He say it's all meaningless, but it's still a fun game. So I think, for me, it's not such a fun game. It's an okay game, but <laughs> I have more fun games than this one. Yeah, so so this is where I also think um, there are unintended consequences outside of mathematics when questions like this aren't taken seriously or the conclusions like, oh, math is just a game, um, don't propagate outside of the math community because all the other disciplines seem to be looking up to mathematics, as, as I said, as if they're speaking the language of God. And, you know, there's this phrase, the math speaks for itself. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But that's that, if that's not true and not even the mathematicians at the highest level. No, no, no levels, I'm talking yeah. about the esoteric set theory. Right, we have right. The, the, the stuff that is used in physics is very useful. Right, right. And that completely can be resurrected uh, in my approach. Uh, and this is probably uh, in a platonic sense uh, as 
certain as can be once it's interpreted correctly. Yeah, uh, yes. And, and the, the set theory is a game, but it has no relevance to uh, applied math. Yes, yes, to, yes. And I, I'm saying even even the esoteric set theory, people yeah. will appeal to outside of math outside of mathematics. So that's what I'm saying. There's I see it because I have these you know conversations about philosophy all the time, and it's yeah. amazing how many conversations will ultimately end up coming to the philosophy of mathematics. People make I think, yeah. rather poor arguments, and then they'll, they'll appeal to set theory, and then they not only you know, there's something unique about set theory is it's not just one esoteric. Um, area of mathematics, it's treated in the in the storytelling of mathematicians. It's treated as fundamental. It's treated as yeah, as that's a kind true. Of... That's a dogma. That's a prevailing dogma. But probably in a hundred years, possibly uh, fifty years, people will laugh at it. Or most people, so of course, there's, there's still there's people who believe that the earth is flat. So <laughs> not completely. But, <laughs> right. It's like of of all of the areas that uh, we would want. We would want maybe a little more rigor than, oh, this is just a game. It seems like set theory would be one of those areas, given how yeah. it's supposed to be foundational. Right. Okay, so... Yeah, but that's an infinite dogma, right? But that's a matter of religion. So that, that's, the, that's the thing I want to talk to you about, is... Um, so you say in 100 years, you think people will look back and, and kind of laugh. Can you... Yeah, that's very conservative. That's what I'm very safe. <laughs> okay. I probably won't be alive in a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do you think that, so what's kind of your expectation for the future of mathematics? Do you think that we're going to see like a revolution or ma our young mathematicians? Yes, yes. Well, oh, you do. Content wise become much deeper and more interesting. And all the previous human degenerated things will be done very, very fast automatically. And there'll be so much new. So uh, discoveries, done by computer, uh, most of them will be what I call semi-rigorous or not even rigorous. Also, the adherence to the rigorous proof will become very soon obsolete because even computers can probably, the really deep theorems uh, will be out of reach because computers are finite and they cannot do everything. So, uh, so my vision is mathematics will become more a science because they really want to know what's actually true. And the insistence on a completely rigorous proof will be optional if possible, but, uh, uh, and there'll be something I, what I call semi-rigorous proof, that you prove something with probability uh, 99.999999, and this would be acceptable mm. uh, to them. So do you think uh, uh, um, when, we, when we reach that point, the the storytelling of the 20th century is just going to fade away? Or do you think it's going to be like, well, that's... Because I have a hard time, just when I observe from the outside, seeing yeah. much progress. I mean, I see you, I see maybe a couple other mathematicians out there in universities yeah. that seem to be saying kind of uh, similar things, but it seems like 99% of the profession is just totally sold on some of the, the, the ideas of the 20th century. Yeah, but things change so much. Even, even the computers, uh, 20 years ago, most... Many people doubted uh, the validity of the, four, the proof, the Apple hacking proof of the four color theorem, uh, and proof by computers on current in that uh, experiment. And, uh, but uh, now, even the most orthodox one would not doubt it. Mm. We'd still be reluctant, still uh, say, ideally, there'd be a nice human proof. But uh, so things are also, the attitude is changing slowly already, I can see it. Mm. And so uh, when a new generation comes, and uh, things will change. So you have to wait for the old people to die, as <laughs> Planck says or somebody. So, so how, what then have your experiences been in the math community? So, so I, I kind of want to know when you started having a lot of these, these heretical thoughts, if this is something that's yeah. been over your whole lifetime, or was there a, a moment in which things changed? And then when you talk to your colleagues, do people just look at you like you're totally crazy, or are they, or are they like, okay, yeah, actually, you're making some good points. Maybe, maybe we do need some fundamental revision. Uh, yeah, to, to be honest, most mathematicians are so busy doing their own little tiny acre gardening. They don't really give... Uh, any consider they don't really care about foundational issues. So uh, for for them, uh, it's like somebody being. So, so they don't take me seriously. So thing is just uh, uh, here's somebody who wants to get attention. So uh, in addition to my uh, philosophical uh, 
so-called outspoken thing. I'm also a, main, a, a regular uh, run-of-the-mill commentarist when I do conventional stuff. Mm. So for most most mathematician colleagues, uh, many of them probably aren't even aware of it because that's too busy doing their own uh, very, very narrow, uh, often very deep, but narrow part uh, of mathematics. Mm. So mathematicians are very philosophically uninterested. They only uh, they have this belief, very naive belief of, of God, but they don't really think about it too much. Mm. It's like, like a like a naive religious person. So we take God for granted, but they, they don't. It's not a scholar. Uh, what about students? Do you find students are more open to what you're saying, or interested? Yes, in yes. It? My students, my students are more interested in this than my colleagues. Mm. My colleagues couldn't, couldn't care less. Most of them. Mm. The I thing, I'm an eccentric. I mean, I'm a good. Uh, I'm okay mathematician, even probably uh, a good one in my specialty, which is one of maybe 200 different specialties. Mm. So in my little part of mathematics, which is maybe one hundred one percent of all mathematics, I'm okay. Uh, functioning, mm. good citizen, and uh, everything else is as somebody uh, uh, who has crazy ideas uh, about. So the thing is that maybe he wants to have attention, uh, grab attention. Then exactly that's my wife claims. My wife claims that my motivation is to get attention. So, but the students are more open. So, so when did this? When did this happen? Is this? Have, have you had suspicions all along that some of the fundamental? Oh yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Of course, I was gradual. I, I was I was born and raised in the uh, current dogma, but uh, part, partly it's also personal. Uh, the course that I hated, I still got an A, but the course that I hated most in college was real analysis mm. because it seemed to me so pedantic and so uh, unattractive compared to other uh, to algebra I liked because it had more content. And when you prove something. Uh, you prove something is not intuitively obvious, but this analysis, this pedantic epsilon delta, uh, was just uh, very, very uh, unattractive to me. Mm. So that's how the grain started. Yeah. Also, my PhD was uh, doing discrete analog of something continuous. Mm. So my love affair with discrete started in my PhD. Yeah, I've, I've, um, so I don't really have any background in mathematics. Like I said, I just come at it from a philosophical. But you perspective. seem to know a lot. Well, yeah. I, thank you. I, it's just been many years of research, and you might find it funny. Right? I, I don't think mathematicians um, could possibly understand the amount of bad arguments that are made outside of mathematic, uh, mathematics by appealing to mathematics. I mean, it is just yeah. this is the reason I got interested in it is just from so many bad arguments I was hearing. Yeah, yeah, right. It's propaganda. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, and most of it is charlat- charlatanism. Uh, for example, economics, many economics are charlatans. Uh, some of them uh, consciously, some of them unconsciously. They're trying to prove uh, using mathematical rigorous things right. to make the point. Right. But, yes, and uh, and even matters of of logic. Uh, uh, you know, for example, I've had com- <laughs> so I had a conversation uh, recorded actually. Um, it was one of the one of the episodes I don't remember off the top of my head with a. A uh, philosopher. Oh, he was a, a mathemat. I don't remember if he was a philosopher or a mathematical logician. One of the two um, from mm-hmm. Colombia, um, and mm-hmm. we were talking about logical contradictions. And he said, "Well, yeah. he gave two examples. I'm not exaggerating. He gave two examples of what he thought could be true logical contradictions. Uh, one, he said, could be the Pope. Is the Pope married or not married? <laughs> and he said, I, I'm not kidding. He said, Well, there's a sense in which the Pope is married to the Church." <laughs> and he's unmarried. I thought, what are you? You're a professor. How was this happening? Uh, and the other, he said, was infinite sets. He said, that seems like it's a contradiction, and yet it's this fundamental part of mathematics. And so I was thinking, okay, well, I got to research this. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but what I wanted to say is also, I've, just in, the, in some of the articles that I've written, I, occasionally, this probably will bother you, um, occasionally yeah. I've gotten messages from people will email me and they'll say, hey, Steve, you know, I love this article. I used to be really into mathematics. And as I was studying it, I found these ideas about infinity or set theory to be so uh, incorrect. I then assumed <laughs> I didn't have the knack for math anymore. And I just quit. Oh, my God. Yes. You, you, you're chasing people away. <laughs> You're like Socrates. You should be. You yeah, should be well, no, it's, it's not. It's not me. It's them. It's it's. Uh, no, yeah, right. yeah, they're saying that they thought that the the 
so 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 they like my articles, but they in their yeah. train their formal training, they yeah. couldn't make sense of of set theory and thought this must mean I'm I'm bad at mathematics, therefore I'm not going to pursue mathematics because it doesn't make sense to me. I just see that as yeah. a tragedy. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully they can see the light that finite mathematics is still fun. Yes. Meaningful. Yes. Well, I'll make sure to send them to uh, to your work and others. And I wonder. I wonder too. Um, this is this is both a, a a question for my podcast and a personal one. Do you collaborate with many people? Like, do you have a network of of heretical mathematicians that are that are working together? Because I would love to talk with more of them and try to be more networked in this community. Well, my, my most uh, constant collaborator is my own computer. Had, and most of my recent papers are in collaboration uh, with it, not not him or her. It's a computer. It's it. And uh, as far as, well, you can't call them heretical, but they're doing uh, experimental mathematics, and they don't really think about the foundations. So implicitly, uh, they're doing a new kind of uh, mathematical experimental mathematics. But uh, to be honest, uh, most of them uh, don't, care about the philosophical underpinnings mm. and for them it's just a, a job and they do what they like so if they are heretical it's only implicitly okay without them knowing knowing that they are okay uh, it's a, have you come across the work of norman weilberger who's a he's a professor yeah yeah, yeah. At, yeah. i really i really ad, ad, admire uh, him but uh but once, once again uh, in a view whatever he spend so much time doing can be summarized in one sentence. So it's good <laughs> that he pros- proselytizes. It's good to have people like him. But uh, for me, it's so obvious. So uh, I don't think, uh, I think he always does it uh, as far as the time he spent hmm. in preaching the world because it's so obvious to me. Hmm. But sure, uh, I'm sure he does a good purpose. I agree with his rational. I really like this book, Rational Trigonometry, mm-hmm. so that everything can be done by rational numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so the last question I want to ask you is again, um, I know like the, the, the current uh, religion, not just in mathematics, but the current intellectual religion is, is yeah. really utter deference to whatever comes out of the math profession. And so I know a lot of people when hearing this, you know, this is, this is like hearing that there's no God um, if you've been yeah. a, a theist your whole life. So the actual, like within the academic process, um, do you have a lot of uh, respect for or, or trust in the academic process as it is in terms of publishing? So, like, have you found obstacles for getting some of your work published? Definitely, definitely. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a whole... Uh, it's a, that's like a... Suppose that somebody uh, published in the... Uh, if Jesus, Jesus submitted the paper to the, uh, to the Journal of Jewish... Uh, the temple, of course, it gets rejected. So yeah, it's very orthodox. So luckily, uh, uh, I, I no I, I no longer my papers that I do my, with myself with my in my computer. My computer doesn't care about tenure, mm. and that, I'm not going to go up for tenure for promotion. So my computer kindly agreed. We only post it on the archive that is non-refereed mm-hmm. and in our website. It's completely irrelevant. The peer reviews. Uh, journals that are completely, uh, uh, completely uh, uh, prejudiced against uh, new ideas. Unfortunately, I have quite a few PhD students and other collaborators who still need, for career mm-hmm. pra- practical reasons, uh, official peer-reviewed publications. And then I try to go to uh, places where I know the editor, who are more broad-minded, and, and not just submit this blindly mm-hmm. to uh, random mainstream journal for which the chances of being accepted is nil. In fact, what I do, I first write email to the editor who sometimes happens to be, happens to be a friend, ask for the frank opinion, whether he's comfortable considering it. Mm. So that's the way around it. Do you think that's something that's also uh, destined to change in the future is the peer review yes, process? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 the peer review things will probably also be obsolete very soon. Uh, eventually, a computer will check the correctness Mm. And as far as the interest or significance, quote unquote, the future will decide. Mm. So it's also going to be obsolete. Well, okay. I do. I know I said that was the last question, but I have one more question for you. Um, 
it yeah. sounds like so I, I did I was able to interview um, Dr. Weilberger in Australia and we had a great conversation. Yeah, and yeah no, he, I really admire him. Yeah, yeah I do too. And uh, we were talking about kind of the role of philosophy in mathematics, and he had the um, the perspective that that philosophy shouldn't have much to say in mathematics, which was very funny to me because I thought so much of his criticism and so much of his work comes from a philosophical perspective, but he doesn't, he doesn't like label it as philosophy. He thinks it's just mathematics. No, no, maybe he probably meant official philosophy. Uh, so in a way, what he does is philosophy. Right, right. So I wonder for you, when you're thinking about kind of the role, the, the, the hierarchy of, of knowledge in, in a sense, do you think that philosophy, not philosophy proper, not from professional you know, philosophers, but the philosophy yeah. of mathematics, or maybe you could call it metamathematics, is in a sense yeah. more fundamental than the actual like applied mathematical work? Well, more is, it, is too strong, but it's at, at least as interesting mm. and uh, and it's much more interesting than many of the details of uh, the object level mathematics that very soon will be done much faster and better with mm -hmm. computers. So yes, so in some sense, this is still room for humans. Uh, uh, philosophy, in some sense, uh, will become uh, more prominent because that's something humans mm -hmm. still can do probably uh, better than computers for some time. <laughs> right. And for the mathematics, uh, we won't need humans anymore space one yeah that's a that's a fantastic note to end on um i really appreciate this conversation dr zyberger dr zyberger this has been this has been great and inspiring and i feel like um this is really an area where i want to keep doing more research because every once in a while like you know, people will tell me, Steve, you're crazy. You got all these crazy ideas in math. And then when I find somebody that, you know, is in the academy and still is saying some very finitistic things, I'm like, ah, okay, I'm justified. Yeah, and thank you so much for getting me to know your wonderful site. And I'm looking forward to uh, browsing and even uh, listening to some of the podcasts that you posted in the past. And keep up the good work. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. And you as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.